And so the difficulty is that um, in our setting, um, as well as in many real life settings, you must act before the true state is revealed um, and you only have some predictions in hand. Um, and of course, if somebody told you that, you know, the predicted road congestions are X, Y, and Z, then uh, you have every reason to, uh, you know, question uh, various things about these predictions, right? So uh, they might be consistently uh, over or underestimating uh, road congestion uh, in various uh, regions of uh, uh, parts of your city. Uh, this is Philly, I think. Um, so yeah, this is this is Schuylkill on the left and Delaware on the right. Uh, or you know many many other reasons for which your predictions might be uh, off, and you might want to correct. Uh, for some biases as a decision maker before using these predictions. So today we want to talk about um, ways to develop um, a prediction uh, algorithm that has the property that downstream decision makers can just take uh, the prediction for the state as hat and just use it as if it was the real um, state and not regret it later. Okay. So. The concept of calibration is known as um, a particularly nice way of enforcing this. So the definition of calibration um, is that whenever you predict uh, some S hat, then conditional on that prediction uh, and expectation S hat will transpire. Okay. So where the expectation uh, could be, you know, it would be interpreted like in the empirical sense uh, in an online setting, which we'll in fact look at today. And it's a good idea to follow calibrated forecasts um, to, yeah, uh, literally, uh, you know, uh, take you uh, at your word. And uh, the proof for that is pretty simple. And so the proof, ah, Excellent. The proof is here. The proof just says that no matter what other policy you could have, the policy which simply best responds to the predicted calibrated state uh, as if it was right uh, is always the dominant thing to do. Uh, and in this argument, uh, you can see you can see there's there, there are some steps that hold by linearity. Um, so we start off with uh, F star, which is the best response strategy. After that, we can uh, separate the expectations uh, and we can pull in the expectation over the true state S. And so uh, eventually uh, in the third expression, you can see that we're in fact looking at the ex expected utility with uh, the expectation of S given S hat plugged in, which by, by definition of calibration is exactly S hat itself. And so at this point, we have a utility function uh, where uh, from the point of view of this utility function, it looks like the true state is in fact S hat and the action that is being chosen is a best response under this utility function to S hat. So this must be uh, this must give a better utility value than uh, following any other policy uh, that's a function of S hat. Okay, so basically, uh, by definition of calibration. So, yeah, uh, if there are any questions, uh, please ask at any point. Um, there might also be uh, an arbitrary number of typos and you know notational inconsistencies. So. Uh, Always happy to answer any questions. Okay, so this is the concept of calibration. And here we have, I guess, some, oh, okay. So yeah, the animations will be off, I guess, uh, because of Google Docs or Google Slides. But yeah, so there are some good things and bad things about calibration. So first off, for, for the good news, calibration is great because predictions can be taken at face value and sort of mean what they say. Uh, and as we just saw, they incentivize downstream agents to treat them as correct. And um, there's, there's a lot of work starting in the 90s that shows that uh, calibration uh, can in fact be obtained even in online adversarial environments. So uh, this is quite a robust phenomenon. For some bad news, 
uh, calibration does not uh, imply that your prediction is good otherwise. So you could get away with predicting uh, just the mean response uh, the entire time um, and uh, be calibrated. Or if you don't know the mean response, but you know everything's relatively stable, then you can just keep going with it and you'll be close to uh, calibrated. But that's not gonna be useful. And then another big problem is that if our state is high dimensional, so the state lives in RD for some large D, then uh, calibration by definition will be uh, quite cumbersome to achieve. So first off, even if, uh, you know, even assuming that the, uh, there's a way to discretize um, sort of uh, the range of possible states, then uh, we'll get uh, the curse of dimensionality. So uh, the computational complexity of calibration would scale exponentially with the MBN dimension. And also, um, as it was shown, the uh, online algorithm that exists for this setting uh, would obtain roughly on the order of t to the d or d plus one um, calibration error, which is painfully slow when d is high. Okay, so calibration is nice, but uh, hard to obtain. And the natural question is, like, can we do something simpler and uh, still get like all the perks, at least all the perks that we know of that calibration can offer uh, in a more tractable way? Okay, so can we do? A, uh, can we have a relaxation of calibration? which still, for example, incentivizes downstream agents to treat these forecasts as if they were the ground truth. And then also, yeah, can we uh, obtain it efficiently through some uh, interpretable algorithm and not suffer from these super slow uh, regret rates that, cal that like calibration proper has, okay? And then also, uh, you know, the next question, which, you know, uh, we'll sort of see uh, what the relevance is. But um, in fact, uh, this relaxation of calibration will help us uh, deal with some uh, high dimensional action spaces um, for downstream decision makers. And, you know, uh, the moral of the story will be that if the downstream decision maker has an efficient oracle for optimizing over uh, some huge action space, then that will mostly suffice. And uh, you don't need to worry about sort of like calibrating to all these many, many uh, possible actions um, in some settings. Okay. And so our setting is uh, a pretty standard online prediction setting. Uh, so I'll go over it very quickly. There's a context space uh, of unspecified nature. There's a convex compact uh space of possible uh outcomes or predictions for the state which we call c uh so uh this is where our, our state states live and this is where uh our predictions for the states will also uh live uh, eventually okay and then in rounds one through t uh for some time horizon uh the learner will observe some context if available uh will make a prediction as hat t for the state in the SRAM t, and then eventually the adversary um, uh, will report back the actual state realizing the SRAM. Okay, so an online adversarial setting. Okay, and now and now we get to uh, what we want to require here. So let me uh, define what I mean by conditionally unbiased here. So conditioning here will be with respect to events, which in the online setting um, will be represented by uh, maps of the following form. They take in the context xt, and they take in your prediction of the states uh, in round t, s hat t. Uh, and they can also take prior history if you want, but uh, didn't include here to uh, not overload notation. And the output either just zero or one, or in fact, maybe anything in the interval zero to one, where zero stands for uh, the event being sort of active in the current round and one stands for, or yeah, zero stands for the event being inactive, let's say, and one stands for the event being active and something between zero and one means something in between, okay? So our events are just simple mappings like this. 
Uh, and they might be, uh, if you want, uh, pre-specified beforehand, or they might be gradually revealed over time. So uh, you might not know what uh, any particular event will say about like being active or not in the next round before you're uh, until you're done with this current round. Okay. Um, and so given a collection of these events, we want to be uh, unbiased conditional on them with our state predictions. Okay, so what does this mean? This means uh, the following, um, that in the L infinity norm for any event in this collection of events, which uh, for this talk, uh, think of as finite, and I think extending it to infinite collections of events with, let's say, bounded VC dimensions, uh, algorithmically speaking, would be a great question uh, for future work. Uh, but so yeah, uh, for each of the finally many events, we want to make sure that the uh, sort of the weighted sum of the biases conditional on that event uh, is small. And in particular, we want to be penalized by no more than the log of uh, the total number of events in our collection uh, times uh, some alpha e, which in the most ideal scenario, we would like to have it be something like the root of the number of times that the events occur, right? Or if the events are not binary, but can be uh, can assume values inside of zero one, then in fact, we can like put a square on top of that to uh, make the bounds uh, even stronger, okay? But basically we would like um, our uh, predictions bias Uh, right, even though we're in an adversarial setting here, uh, which is root of the number of appearances of that events so far. Okay, and one thing to observe about this is that if we pick our collection of events to consist of all possible conditionings on all possible values of our prediction, we would, rec we would recover the definition of uh, vanilla calibration that we just talked about. Okay, so. In, in a high dimensional setting, where S lives in RD, the number of events uh, would be exponentially large in D in this collection, which sort of says that, uh, you know, this framework is a relaxation of calibration to settings where you're satisfied with smaller collections of conditioning events. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so now uh, the same questions uh, as before are, does this sort of unbiasedness actually help us with anything for modestly sized uh, collections of events uh, rather than full on calibration? And can we obtain uh, this guarantee efficiently for such modestly sized uh, collections of events? Okay. Okay. And so this is this is the overall roadmap. So uh, I guess this is like the first uh, of. Uh, a subset of sli uh, of the slides that, like you know, if if you remember what's on the slide, then uh, yeah, you've gotten you know a constant fraction uh, of the message uh, that I wanted to uh, get across. Uh, so in our setup, right, we'll have this mysterious black box which provides um, predictions that are unbiased, conditional on uh, the collection of events, and. Uh, basically across rounds one, two, and all the way up until some time horizon, if it exists, uh, we'll be fitting in contexts and like past realized states and the relevant events into that black box. It'll spit out uh, predicted states, S hat T. And then what we want to imagine is that an entire, like one or maybe an entire group of decision makers downstream see the prediction S hat T. And then each of them has their own utility function, maybe U1, U2, et cetera. And each of them would like to, you know, ease their own cognitive burden and just best respond to what they're seeing. And our objective is to make sure that in fact, uh, our predictions as hat T are such that every single uh, downstream decision maker is incentivized to do so, to just best respond. Okay, and for that, our unbiased prediction black box will also need to uh, be told uh, 
these utility functions in advance. So if you if you don't know uh, what the utility functions of the downstream decision makers are, then there's not as much that you can do. So before making the prediction S hat T, uh, the unbiased prediction back box will also be told uh, about the decision makers that will be using this prediction. Okay. So yeah, if there are any questions here, again, happy to answer. Okay, so uh, there's a bunch of notions of regret that we could use to sort of quantify uh, how uh, well off downstream decision makers will be after following our um, recommended predictions, right? So let's say our road congestions and they're trying to get from point A to point B. So first off, the agent will have no external regrets um, if there is no fixed action that that agent should have played uh, at the end of time uh, that would uh, compare beneficially um, uh, relative to the actual sequence of actions picked by that agent. Uh, and the agent has no internal regrets if more strongly there is no way to swap uh, any one action for another action, okay? Or more generally, with respect to any mapping from uh, the action space into itself, uh, there's no way to swap any two actions uh, to improve um, the overall uh, utility sum. Okay, and two things to note are that, first off, for these action uh, spaces, uh, if all agents in a certain strategic interaction have low internal regrets, then play will converge to an approximate correlated equilibrium, which uh, um, you might care about from a game theoretic perspective. Okay. And there's other notions of regrets, such as adaptive regrets, which uh, we'll be able to deal with uh, using our framework. But these are two examples. Okay. So uh, as, as a warm up, here is an argument that uh, should uh, convince you that this relaxation is in fact uh, 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 promising. Specifically, there's this um, well-known result of Foster and Vora uh, that states that calibration implies no internal regret. And if you just use uh, plain old calibration, then of course you will run into these issues described before that calibration uh, proper is pretty slow and computationally infeasible in high dimensions. But we can actually get no internal, no swap regret much more simply uh, with a much smaller collection of conditioning events. Specifically, uh, there will be as many conditioning events as uh, elements in the agent's action space. Here we assume there's a single downstream agent uh, with some utility function u, but you can easily extend it to more um, agents. Uh, and the events will be defined as follows. Uh, for any action a that the agent could play, the event indexed by a uh, would be active over those rounds where the agent, in fact, played that action in response two hour. Mm -hmm. Aaron has a question. Okay, yeah, excellent. Yeah, happy, happy to answer. Uh, yeah, sorry, this may be a naive question. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm following so far, but um, this notion that calibration implies no internal regret, uh, can you briefly explain how that holds for the naive or trivial calibration of like a constant um, state estimator that, you know, you described um, how some calibrations can be trivial and not necessarily useful. Um, wouldn't they in those cases still be able to have internal regret or is the idea that the calibration implies no internal regret under that calibration or um d does this question make sense yes yeah, so so, cal so so the, na the nature of, of of the class of the classic result is that it's it states that if you receive predictions that are fully calibrated like uh you know in, in the sense that we like talked about before and like you know if we go like through you know the same type of argument as before where we say well you know should you best respond or not right uh you can in fact best respond to calibrated predictions 
and you will, I think, somewhere on the slide or so. Uh, but yeah, the main idea, uh, and there's, there's like, I guess a few possible ways to formulate it, but the main idea is that if your predictions are fully calibrated, then the agent uh, that in this case has the linear utility function basically uh, does not care uh, if your prediction is just a calibrated one, but not the true state, or if it is the true state. So there is there is no there is no difference from the perspective of utility function, and then what you're going to say is that for any two actions that you could consider swapping for one another, right? Uh, you will have you will have the utilities uh, for one of these actions, so like the cumulative utility, and you'll have the cumulative utility for the other action. Uh, and since you're always best responding to your uh, to our prediction, and you're incentivized to treat it as correct, then when I ask you, would you like to have swapped your decision and played B instead of playing A, your answer will naturally be no, because, you know, uh, because of the guarantee that, you know, uh, best responding is incentivized. So uh, you don't need to play anything else. And so when I tell you, like, swap A for B, you say no, because A was my best response and I was incentivized to play it. So, you know, any other B would have been... Uh, you know, equal or worse, uh, if that makes sense. So yeah, that's- it does. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah, I think I think I um, sort of misinterpreted, uh, if you go one slide over that, that sort of like trivial um, uh, uh -huh. constant prediction calibration um, in this context. So thank you for that clarification. That makes a lot of sense. Oh yeah, 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 cool. Uh, yeah, th th thanks for asking. Um, yeah, and so yeah, in fact, the argument that I just told you will be exactly the same arguments that we'll use here. So, um, you know, because we only care about incentivizing the agent to sort of best respond to our predictions here, right? So uh, here our events will just say that our predictions, you know, like no other constraints on them other than over those rounds when the downstream agent played action A uh, in response to our predictions, that that action was in fact, uh, uh, that the S hats were in fact uh, unbiased over those rounds. Okay, and so so yeah, I'll I'll sort of flash the proof in a second. But the claim here uh, is pretty nice and strong compared to just requiring full calibration because we only have uh, the number of actions conditioning events, and in fact uh, we can easily combine uh, these guarantees for many downstream agents if we so desire with only a logarithmic penalty. Uh, okay. So, yeah, the argument for internal regret without calibration is very simple. For any pair of actions A and A prime, uh, the downstream agent wouldn't have wanted to swap uh, A for A prime simply because uh, exactly as, as in the informal argument before, uh, we are unbiased over those rounds when that agent played an action A, and also when that agent played uh, any other ac action for that matter. Uh, and since our predictions were unbiased over those rounds, then the agent was in fact incentivized to play a best response to simply our predictions over those rounds. And so when you propose an alternative action A prime, then uh, uh, the agent tells us no, I already best responded and it was in my best interest to do so. So I don't want to switch over to any other action um, A prime. And here we accumulate, uh, you know, the uh, bias error. So if we have bias alpha, then, you know, what I just said as if it holds exactly holds approximately up to that bias. And there's like a Lipschitz constant uh, that you can multiply that bias by if your Lipschitz, uh, your utility is like more than like one Lipschitz, okay? Okay, and uh, sort of, uh, I'm happy that we, we've gotten to this part already. So this is uh, one of the cooler parts. So let's consider the setting of online combinatorial optimization. So um, as customary, we have a set of base actions, uh, and then we have a feasible set of actions that 
essentially consist in taking uh, some subset of the base actions, okay? And so, so there are many examples such as routing or uh, some spanning tree problems, et cetera, et cetera, um, that uh, are very productive and interesting to study. Uh, and in these settings, we'll define our state that we want to predict as the vector corresponding to the base actions. So for each base action, we would like to uh, predict the gain that the agent will receive from uh, putting that action in their, uh, in their uh, set, okay? And so the utility here uh, for the agent will naturally be linear, okay? So it'll just be the sum over all actions included in the uh, set um, of the gains of these actions. So for example, uh, in the routing setting, uh, your total congestion across a path uh, would be the sum of your uh, congestion across uh, all individual links in that path. Okay, so lots of possible actions for each agent, but there's a linear structure. Okay, so there's exponentially many uh, actions uh, than there are uh, base actions. Okay, and the special case when uh, all your actions are base actions would correspond to uh, uh, the standard expert setting, okay? And the online component uh, basically has us do this online. Okay, and so, yeah, this is this is a slide where <laughs> there's supposed to be <laughs> some, like, flashing and blinking, so might not happen, or might. Okay, so, yeah, it's not happening, so that's uh, that's a pity. So, let's see, maybe... Maybe at least something happens to the graph to the left. Nope, nothing happens. Okay, so let me just tell you guys what, what was supposed to happen in the slide. So there's this there's this network where there's like a source in the sink, and there's an agent that wants to get from the source to the sink and basically has uh, around three different paths to do so. And so what you should imagine happening is at each round, uh, we're Google Maps, uh, conveniently, uh, for this talk, uh, but I would have used this example anyways. Uh, and we're going to tell you, for each of these five edges, what's uh, you know the travel time uh, going to look like from our point of view. And then you would ideally, naively, uh, solve this problem by doing some Dijkstra or Bellman Ford or what have you, and just pick um, whichever path you want. Okay, and so uh, what you see here is that you know we're giving these five-dimensional predictions to the agent, and in round one, based on these predictions, the agent best responded and chose the path A, B. Okay, so what's our collection of events gonna be uh, for the for this case, and like more generally from comet, uh, for like all online comet home observation settings? So you know, just uh, look at this setting, and you'll know exactly what uh, we would do in the general case. We would define five events in this case corresponding to each one of the actions and when as a result of our prediction as a function of our prediction uh the agent best responded and picked the path a b then we flash the events corresponding to edge a and, and edge, b, edge b okay so these events will be active in that round the edges that are not used by the path will be inactive okay so here all events are binary one means active zero means inactive in the second round suppose we then give, you know, the next set of predictions, like having seen the actual congestions in round one, and the agent decided through optimizing using, let's say, Dijkstra, that path ACE is the optimal one. Then we make the events corresponding to edge A, edge C, and edge E active, and the other two are inactive, okay? And then we keep going like this. So in each round, the agent receives predictions, optimizes, and you know, for this works clearly for any combinatorial optimization setting where you have, you know, Oracle access to an efficient algorithm that, given uh, the payoffs at the base actions, can optimize for uh, the best uh, set valued action. Okay, and this is exactly what we would do in any such setting. We would define as many events as there are base actions, and we would make predictions that are unbiased, conditional on, uh, conditional on each of these base actions being included in the set, okay? And what I claim is that, in fact, through doing that, we obtain no swap regret, 
with respect to the actual set of set valued actions for the agent. Okay. Even though I just have I just have five uh, events here. Okay. In this example, I also have not that many possible paths from source to sync, but <laughs> typically, you know, you have many paths. You have exponentially many paths uh, from source to sync. So, uh, and I claim I, I will obtain no software with respect to all of those paths. How so? Well, uh, if you if you recall the unbiasedness condition with respect to each of these uh, events, what it would say is that is that for each of these actions, um, the total um, yeah our prediction our prediction for the edges was unbiased uh, whenever that edge occurred, and so then what happens is that we can directly compare any two paths that the agent might have selected, like path A and path A prime. And we can actually we can actually compute by this unbiasedness. Um, we can actually compute what the uh, utility uh, from playing A would have been. And we can also compute what the utility from playing A prime would have been because the utility decomposes into uh, the utility of having uh, each of the constituent edges in the in the path, and so in that manner, very similar to what we just discussed for uh, a simple agent with like a simple action set about uh, where we didn't know anything about its structure. Here, and we'll once again uh, get no swap regret. Okay, and so one thing to observe here um, uh, is that we can generalize this even further, and we're talking about swap regret here, but really we can talk about any notion of regrets that falls under the umbrella of subsequence regret. So what is subsequence regrets? Uh, you have a set of subsequences that become active or inactive um, given uh, some uh, given the context xt and round t and the action, uh, the agent's uh, action. And so then the agent has low subsequence regret if uh, the agent has uh, low external regret conditional on each of these subsequences, OK? So here, internal regret would be the special case of the subsequences that are just defined by the agent playing each possible action in the action set. Okay, and um, the same arguments that we used for getting no uh, internal no swap regret in the setting of uh, online commentarial representation would apply to the subsequent regrets. So we would, we would just define a slightly different family of events that, um, and these events would be like a Cartesian product of uh, the event that some subsequence is active from the definition of subsequent regrets and uh, the events that we played, that we included a certain base action in our set. Okay. So I have mm -hmm. one question. Mm -hmm. So. In this like online routing example, mm -hmm. um, let's say the agent always picks the path like A B or like one specific path. Mm -hmm. So then your like calibration constraint is that um, you know like on the rounds where they picked like edge A or edge B, like yeah, your yeah. predictions are calibrated for that. But it doesn't say anything about your predictions for the other edges. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, great question. So, so yeah, we uh, yeah we cannot give any guarantees for uh, things that were not played sufficiently often. So uh, yeah, so essentially you're you're going to be comparing. You're only going to be like these comparisons that I mentioned will only be like valid for pairs of actions that were played sufficiently often, basically. And, uh, I, and so all the pairs have to be played. But if if like uh, every edge is played sufficiently often, then you can. So do you get low external regret in the setting, like um, like you know, compared to like all the other paths in the graph, or is it like only with respect to paths that you've played? Like so, so you end up getting no swap regrets, like in the traditional definition of no swap regrets, which uh, you can get. Like our unbiasedness guarantees hold, uh, you know, with this adaptivity in mind. So like for each event, the bias will be proportional to like the square root of the number of times that that event occurred. For example, that that edge was picked, mm -hmm. and then like you can you can sort of like plug that in and you can optimize and the worst case scenario will in fact be that like each edge got played like you know some you know number of times that was like you know uh, 
Uh, okay, okay. Around, around, like proportional to t. So yeah, uh, but yeah, gr great point. So yeah, like in all these intuitive comparisons, you know, you can assume that things were play were all played sufficiently often, but uh, this is in fact borne out in uh, in the actual derivation. Yeah. Also, just warning. Maybe try to reach like a stopping point for the next ten minutes. The, yeah. The good chance you can go over because we started late, but sometimes people come in and take the room. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Of, of course, yeah. So yeah, I guess yeah, I won't be able to go through like all sides because at this point I'm, <laughs> at, but yeah, I'm I'm almost at the end of the uh you know uh, of one of the uh, coolest applications so that's great um okay so and so so the theorem that's like the most general statement that we can make for online combinatorial representation is that in fact we can get low subsequence regrets okay for uh like any arbitrarily defined subsequences but also like including swap regret and we can uh slap on uh such no regret guarantees for more than one agent with only a log logarithmic penalty in the number of such agents. And you can think of no subsequent regret as like an umbrella thing that encompasses external, internal, adaptive, uh, multi-group regrets. Uh, it's, it's like a fairness notion uh, and so on and so forth. Okay, and notice that here I'm saying that the subsequent regret will be proportional, uh, the bound of subsequent will be proportional to D, which is the number of um, uh, uh, base actions, okay? So uh, meanwhile, the guarantee it holds over the entire action set, which is exponential indeed potentially. Okay, so in that sense, we get effectively a logarithmic dependence on the total number of actions. Okay, and so just to flash like uh, previous constructions for swap regret, right? Uh, such as Blum and Sur, right? Which uh, says, okay, you want to get no swap regret with respect to a set of actions. Well, define uh, a separate no external regret algorithm for each action, right? And then combine them in some clever way. And so that would require uh, that you enumerate over all possible actions that you have. And here the actions would in fact be paths in the network, let's say, right? Not the base actions. And it's 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 not at all clear how to how to repurpose things, uh, such reductions like Blum and Sur to instead enumerate over base actions. Okay, so uh, from from my literature search, at, at the, at, like up until now, it was, it was unknown if you can get swap regrets in online combinatorial optimization settings um, that would scale uh, logarithmically in uh, the number of actual set valued actions. Um, so in that sense, you get an exponential improvement. You get it relatively for free uh, by just exploiting the structure of uh, the problem. Okay, uh, and so yeah, some more examples of no subsequence regrets. Like you, you'll get no regret on like rainy days, on national holidays, on days when like the best routes that you can deduce from the predictions involves like taking certain roads that you might or might not like, and so on and so forth. You'll get no external regret conditional like all of these events, and you can just uh, throw them into the event collection. Okay, and so let me just um, a question. I think. Ah, okay, yep. Yep. Um, just, just so I, I um, sometimes mm -hmm. the term agent is overloaded. When you say agent, you mean they're all pulling from the same calibrated predictions, and the only thing they have is unique, um, like action functions and utility functions. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So, so for example, in this case, in this case, you might have like many actions that each want to, or many agents that each want to travel from like some like source S I to sync T I, and then like all of them have their own action sets, which can be large. And for all of them, you know, we offer them these guarantees where they're reading off from the same exact map. So like each of them receives the same map with the same predictions. Uh, so in that sense, we're coordinating them, which I think is another uh, cool thing that here you get essentially for free. Uh, and in that sense, you know, you arrive at various, you know, correlated equilibria or their generalizations to subsequent regret. Okay, so just, yep. So yeah, uh, just to flash like like something about uh, like the design of the algorithm. So uh, the guarantee, uh, in fact, let me scroll to uh, like the most formal looking version of the guarantee that I have in these slides. Okay, so the bias here is denoted by alpha. Uh, for, and uh, I should have said alpha sub E here because for each event E, like you'll have uh, its own um, bias bound, right? Depending on how often that event occurred, right? So you can see here, there's like 
a logarithmic term that repeats itself twice under the square root and outside. So, uh, and it has like a logarithmic dependence on the number of events in the collection, as well as on the dimension of the prediction. So that's the important thing about it. And it has only a logarithmic dependence on the time, eventual time horizon T max. So in that sense, the guarantee is almost any time in the sense that, you know, you like only need to commit to like a very crude bound on like your total number of like possible uh, possible rounds. Uh, and, you know, uh, your regret bounds will almost not be influenced on it. And in fact, what we do in each round to get these unbiased predictions will also not at all uh, depend on uh, this time horizon. So almost horizon free um, and your bias in each event will get correspondingly better, like the more you see uh, of that event. Okay. Um, and yeah, the reduction is uh, pretty cute. Um, there's like a bunch of such reductions in other similar uh, settings where you reduce to essentially computing a fixed point or like, you know, the equilibrium of like a, a zero sum game in each round. And to get these like nice adaptive bounds, the adaptivity would come from you like reducing to this iter iterated fixed point problem using you know the latest and greatest uh experts algorithm so in that sense in that sense um and, and there's also like uh, like ftpl is also taking uh part in this so essentially you can view like these reductions as like taking like a bunch of a bunch of things that are pretty well known and uh, sort of like mixing them together uh, in some uh, hopefully clever way uh, to to take to be able to take advantage of various uh, high dimensional linear structures. Okay. Um, and some more applications uh, that I, I thought would be cool to uh, briefly flash. So one of them is type regrets. So yeah, you can you can imagine, yeah, yes, yeah, so some form of a Bayesian game maybe, right? Uh, uh, um, or any other setting where an agent could plausibly have utility U, but maybe worry that maybe, you know, utility U prime is better, right? So trying to impersonate it, uh, utility U prime. And then you could define uh, a notion of type regret as the regret um, that happens when you best respond to the predictions as if you had a uh, utility function U prime but in reality, your utility function is U, okay? And so uh, through instantiating appropriate events that basically say, you know, you'll have one event for each utility function and each action, and the event will say, though these are the rounds on which, you know, you had util uh, you know, the agent with utility U would have res best responded with A, with action A, right? And you can get uh, a nice uh, uh, bound on type regret for, um, uh, such families, uh, there will be like a logarithmic um, factor uh, in um, the set. No, there won't be a logarithmic factor in the size of a family here. So this for any two um, utilities, U and U prime. Um, another application is best in class prediction, which you can imagine as follows. So we're making these unbiased predictions conditional on some events. And we're promising that it'll be unbiased conditional on things that are relevant for downstream decision making is, is the main pitch. But you might also be worried, like how how well do these predictions fare uh, relative to other competing predictors, right? And uh, also like uh, as measured by various loss functions, right? So like, what about like us compared to some neural nets, you know, um, in terms of the KAL divergence from the ground truth, right? And so there's a best in class result that we can prove by once again, appropriately instantiating the family of our events, um, which will state that if uh, you give me any collection of uh, competing predictors that may or may not be good, the, and you give me all possible sufficiently Lipschitz Bregman divergencies, essentially. And why Bregman, like th th there's a justification for that. It has to do with the fact that Bregman divergencies are closely related to eliciting means, hence eliciting unbiased estimates. But yeah, for various uh, Bregman divergencies like squared loss, KL, et cetera, uh, you, can, you can guarantee uh, that your loss over time, your cumulative loss over the interaction will be no, uh, uh, no greater up to a little of t term than uh, each of 
uh, the losses of each of the finitely many comparator predictors. And so currently this result holds uh, uh, the way I proved it for uh, like uh, finite collections of competing predictors, but for all sufficiently ellipsious Bregman losses simultaneously. And of course, as always, like a great question is how do you extend such a result to, uh, you know, predictors coming from some, you know, class with some uh, learning dimension that's bounded, right? Uh, so yeah, the answer is, uh, I don't know currently. Uh, and I think it would be very cool to get that. Okay, uh, that's just a summary of what I said uh, a minute ago. And um, yeah, some further applications involve uh, involve an uncertainty quantification framework, which I did not elaborate on because, uh, you know, uh, 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 I, I guess, yeah, I, I wanted to focus more on the uh, yeah more typical online learning results that uh, folks uh, in this group would be working with the most. But um, we develop an uncertainty quantification framework, which basically can be thought of as us predicting multi-class probability vectors such that um, if you try to take a subset of the labels in each round, then the probability of the true label belonging to that subset will be exactly uh, as what you see, which is the you know, sum of the predicted probabilities of the classes that you took into your prediction set. So that's like a transparent coverage notion. And uh, we can predict them as accurately as any competing model uh, with respect to Bregman losses, as we just talked about. So there's also some power to it beyond coverage conditions. There's also some fair online learning formulations um, and there's also some reduction to extensive form gains from the online combinatorial optimization uh, thing that we uh, talked about. And then there's like, yeah, a summary of like some high level points. Uh, yeah, I just, yeah, want to say that, uh, yeah, as a few, uh, uh, you know, famous last words, that this framework uh, is nice in the sense that it incentivizes straightforward strategic behavior. So if sort of, eases the cognitive burden off of downstream agents if we know who they are and we know that their utility functions are nice and we can handle many, many of them at once. So in some sense, our predictions will act as a correlation device that will help all these agents be happy and achieve some kind of equilibrium through that. Um, can give best in class predictions uh, over Bregman losses. Um, uh, and sort of from maybe from like a representation uh, perspective, which I think would be very cool to explore. Um, seems like uh, this type of result says if you can, like, if you can, if you have an idea of what like a good way to represent your data would be, uh, like by like a potentially high dimensional but like principled uh, vector, then if that representation is actually good for something, then this framework lets you through its unbiased conditions will let you carry the goodness of that representation downstream. Uh, so, you know, uh, for example, as in the combinatorial optimization where like the represent the nice representation is always pretty clear, just take the base actions. So, um, yeah, and, you know, uh, I hope there might be some further applications in that direction as well. And yeah, it's a relaxation of calibration, which is a very classical notion, but it basically asks you to be calibrated uh, to be unbiased conditional on any possible uh, value of your prediction that you might have output. And that's just too much for like all of these applications that we talked about. Uh, and basically this framework just clusters them together and like treats two predictions as the same for the purposes of downstream decision-making if the downstream decision-makers don't care. Um, yep, and uh, I guess I'll stop here. Great. Yep. Thanks. Thanks, George. Um, any questions? Yep. That was awesome. Thank you. Uh, really mm -hmm. cool treatment. Um, and I'm glad you worked. You know, I was wondering at the beginning if uh, you would bring it back to regret and like regret minimization. I'm really glad um, that you you got to multi agent like the multi agent setting because that's expressly um, relevant to what I'm doing. Um, thanks mm -hmm. a ton. That was a really cool uh, presentation. Yep. Thanks for stopping by. Yeah.